how am I going to be resourceful with the resources I have? Mm -hmm. And you've heard me say this a million times. You have enough resources to get started right now where you are today. You have enough. I don't care if you have a dollar in your pocket, if you know one person, if you're living on the street, if you don't have a car, if you've never started a business, if you've never, uh, if you didn't go to college, I don't care what you have, or I, I don't care what you don't have. What you do have is enough. Mm -hmm. It's enough to get started. It is not enough to succeed. It is likely not enough to succeed at any significant level, but it is enough to get started. So if you've never been a stand-up comic, but you've decided that you want to give it a go, and you've confirmed that you were born with a witty enough brain to do it, and you start to engage with other stand-up comics in a way that you will start to develop advantages, then it doesn't matter if you've never been on stage before. It doesn't matter if you don't have an hour routine. It doesn't matter if you've never watched someone else's special. All that matters is that you have enough things at your immediate disposal to build upon. You have enough resources. So you have to ask yourself, what are the resources I do have? Not what are the resources that I don't have? And you have to start using them in very unique and creative ways. I'm Srini Rao, and this is the Unmistakable Creative Podcast, where you get a window into the stories and insights of the most innovative and creative minds who've started movements, built thriving businesses, written best-selling books, and created insanely interesting art. For more, check out our 500-episode archive at unmistakablecreative.com. Right now, our lives are on our phones. And with our phones full of live-streamed exercise classes, midday work calls, and nightly family video calls, there's no room for fraud calls. Thankfully, AT&T makes customer security a priority, helping block those pesky calls. It's not complicated. AT&T Active Armor, 24-7 proactive network security and fraud call blocking to help stop threats at no extra charge. Compatible device slash service required. Visit at and tcom slash active armor for details. Hi, this is Benjamin from the UK true crime podcast, They Walk Among Us. Brought to you by AMC Networks, Shudder is a premium streaming experience that provides a multi-sensory dive into fantastical worlds, offering the very best of old and new horror. Discover films and series that covers the entire horror spectrum, including highly anticipated new releases like The Boy Behind the Door and Psycho Gorman to giants of the horror genre like the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and Halloween. What's more, you can watch one of my all-time favourite films, Mandy, a spiralling, surreal, bloody journey of revenge with visuals that are simply mind-blowing. Exceptional originals, movies, TV series and live events, there's always something new and unexpected for Shudder members to experience. Sign up at Shudder.com. And now part two of my conversation with Greg. So you have brought up the $10 in the laptop project, which you know, anybody who's been in our audience for a long time, really, that's what you are known for. Uh, but you know, rather than talk about the project itself, I think what I want to talk about was this notion of rebuilding from where somebody is at or rebuilding after a significant setback and what that takes in somebody's life, what's necessary, because you know, I mean, in many ways, that's kind of what Brian and I have had to do in 2015 is rebuild, even though it, it may not have appeared that way to to the outside world. Uh, I, I've kind of gone through that firsthand, and I'm really interested in uh, hearing through the lens of, of you know people that you've met. The other thing I think that would be really interesting to, to hear about is sort of the misperceptions that we all have about this country, because I think that you know one of the things that you really clued me into uh, as I got to know you throughout this project was how warped our entire view of what the United <laughs> States is like for those of us who are online and you know connected nonstop. So yeah. big question, I realize. Well, yeah, it, it is. You'll notice 
a consistent theme throughout my answers um, uh, outside of the fact that I, I always feel uncomfortable because I don't know that I'm the, uh, <laughs> you know, certified uh, uh, to answer these types of questions. But um, the, the consistent theme you'll notice in my answers are everything is to a varying degree, mm-hmm. right? So, so, so to rebuild depends on the degree at which you need to rebuild, right? Or how far you've fallen or, yeah. you know, whatever it might be. But, but the, the people that I tend to to meet and to work with and the people that I was most intrigued by were once again, the people that I felt were unnecessarily suffering, right? So these are people that are capable. They have resources available. They, they are, they live in America. They by and large are educated. So, so they were going through hardships in their life, which we all go through Mm -hmm. that were temporary circumstances. And I was concerned that they would go through them long enough where they would become their permanent reality. So, so, that's the premise with which half of ten dollars in the laptop is built on. That that first half is is how do we take individuals who are going through a, a significant transition in their life, a significant temporary circumstance in their life, and how do we ensure it does not become their permanent reality? And and and, and to give you some sp- specifics about that, what I mean by that is individuals who are laid off mm-hmm. and couldn't find work for you know a year, two years, three years. Individuals that went through, you know, a divorce and 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 found themselves not being able to rebuild uh, a, a relationships in a positive way. Uh, people that went through, um, you know, home foreclosures, the loss of their homes, who who couldn't immediately get back into a, a similar type home living situation. Those types of individuals, you know, coming off of two thousand eight, two thousand nine. Um, I can share later, you know, I, I retired on my 30th, what people don't know is that I retired on my 30th birthday and I decided to no longer be involved in, in, in direct, directly be involved in businesses and instead lend my advisory ship to other businesses, but use the majority of my time doing personal projects. And that's, you know, that's the birth of $10 in a laptop, which we can get in later. Mm-hmm. But, but the point being the reason that, so, so when this project was started, I, I was sitting around saying to myself, What's the next project? And I was also saying to myself, um, uh, I see a consistent pattern pattern developing in America for the first time in my lifetime, which is people are going through a temporary circumstance that is starting to develop and turn into something permanent in their life. Mm -hmm. And it's because the economy took such a nosedive that people were affected at deeply profound levels. So, so when you try to rebuild, what has to happen first is uh, number one is you have to admit to yourself what your identity has been up to this point. That's the first thing. The second thing you have to do is say to yourself, I have to be willing to be identified as something else. So if you, for instance, I worked with a gentleman who was a baker he, you know, he baked goods for a uh, hostess. Hostess went out of business, filed bankruptcy. He lost his job. He had been working at hostess since the age of 22. He was 55, right? So everywhere he goes for 20 some odd years, he's saying to people in his life, I'm a baker. That's identity, mm-hmm. right? Now, He's no longer a baker. He can't get a bakery job. They've laid him off. He can't find work. He's out of work for 18 months, right? So he's thinking to himself, whether consciously or not, but I'm a baker. I'm a baker. Why am I not baking? Why do people not know me as a baker? Why can't I say I'm a baker, right? And and whether that seems silly or not, that's what we do as human beings. That's why I am so uh, anti-label mm-hmm. because I know that as a human being, it's incredibly difficult to continuously rebuild when you are that attached to your identity. Because ultimately, you are not your identity, right? Ultimately, deep down, he's not a baker. He is just performing the duties of a baker, ultimately he's so much more than that but in america we define ourselves by our jobs and our work and our roles Mm -hmm. so much that when those roles are shaken up it's very difficult to overcome that 
And so when, when you have to reinvent yourself or you're even, you know, concerned about putting that on the table, it's because you're so deeply attached to your identity. So one of the first things you and I did, one of the first exercises you and I did when we first started working together is I said, who are you? Write down all the things that you are Mm -hmm. and, and ask yourself in five years, do you want to be those things? Do you want to be someone else's book marketer? Right. Because I knew that the every day that went by that you were attaching yourself to that identity was one more day I was going to have to work my ass off (laughs) (laughs) to unattach you. Right. So so the sooner we could drop those labels Mm -hmm. of things that you don't really want to be associated with your identity, the less work you and I would have to do. So. First and foremost, when you have a hardship in your life, the first thing you have to do is you have to admit, maybe I'm not that. Mm -hmm. That's incredibly embarrassing and difficult to do. Just with yourself, right? Like not even publicly, but just with yourself. If you have to say, maybe I'm not a baker anymore after 20 years of saying that every damn day of your life, Mm -hmm. that's tough, right? Maybe I'm not a teacher. Maybe I'm not just, you know, maybe, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm, I'm, uh, 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 not successful at X. Like I thought I was successful. Like maybe I was really successful at being a real estate agent, but really when I'm honest, that was only because the market was hot. Maybe I'm actually not that good at it. Right. We don't want to have that conversation with ourselves. So the first thing we have to do is write out or acknowledge all the things we identify ourselves as. And we have to start reinterpreting that. We have to start by saying, no, I'm actually just performing the duties of that. I am not that, right? Then we have to decide, do I still want to be that? Should I still be that? Am I capable of still being that? And we have to get super, 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 super honest with ourselves about it. And it really helps when we have people around us, again, where we have these safe environments, where we have smart, intelligent, experienced people that can give us feedback on that. And then we have to start to decide, okay, so what else could I be? Have I always wanted to be? What's been waiting in the wings, right? So, uh, um, you know, most people know me as, publicly know me related to the $10 and laptop, or they know me as a business person, right? Mm -hmm. But that's actually, I'm so much more than that. The things that I spend the most time on are drawing, comedy, like stand-up comedy, um, uh, woodworking, and uh, interior design and fashion, right? Mm-hmm. But, but people don't know me as those things, and I, and I intentionally do that. I do not give you those labels because I want to explore them in a way in which I do not have to attach my de- identity to them because then I have to perform that way. Mm-hmm. And I'm, I, I don't want to do that. I want to explore them in my own ways, not in ways in which you demand I explore them, you being society, right? So, so the first thing you have to do is you have to ask yourselves, the second thing you have to do is you have to ask yourself, what do I want to be? What's been waiting in the wings? What have I always wanted to do? What do I wish I could do? Right? So, so you've got that list. Now you have to say, now you have to have the honest conversation, right? Now you have to have the conversation out of all these things. What's the possibility that I could do this? And what's the probability Mm. I could do this, right? Am I really good? Am I really, is my mind, was I born with a sharp enough mind to be witty enough to be a stand-up comic? I know I want to be a stand-up comic, but was my, my mind born that way? That's a real honest conversation you have to have with yourself, right? Yeah. And then you have to say, okay, these are the areas in which the probability of success is, is likely Now I have to ask myself, how do I increase that probability? Where do I have advantages? This is another thing that I see most new entrepreneurs failing at. They start businesses in which they have zero advantages. Mm -hmm. That is such a high climb. Start on third base. You know, if you can learn nothing else from Donald Trump, you can learn (laughs) not to be an asshole, right? That's rule number one. But the other thing that you can start learn is start on third base. Start with two hundred million dollars if you want to be a billionaire, right? And 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 I mean that, of course, you know, sarcastically. But I also mean that honestly, right? If you wanna if you wanna start a tech company, work at Google first, yeah, right? Like your odds of success in your own tech company just increased dramatically if you had a job at Google, Mm -hmm. right? But what we do is, is we start things with zero advantages. That's very, very hard to do in a world of, you know, or, or, and even in the U S of, you know, in a world of 7 billion people, but in the U S of 330 million and a world of third over 30 million other businesses, Mm -hmm. right? 
Like you're just asking for things, starting with no advantages. So then you have to ask yourself, where do I have advantages? Then you have to ask yourself the most important question in my mind, which is how am I going to be resourceful with the resources I have? Mm -hmm. And you've heard me say this a million times. You have enough resources to get started right now where you are today. You have enough. I don't care if you have a dollar in your pocket, if you know one person, if you're living on the street, if you don't have a car, if you've never started a business, if you've never, uh, if you didn't go to college. I don't care what you have, or I, I don't care what you don't have. What you do have is enough. Mm -hmm. It's enough to get started. It is not enough to succeed. It is likely not enough to succeed at any significant level, but it is enough to get started. So if you've never been a stand-up comic, but you've decided that you want to give it a go, and you've confirmed that you were born with a witty enough brain to do it, and you start to engage with other stand-up comics in a way that you will start to develop advantages, then it doesn't matter if you've never been on stage before. It doesn't matter if you don't have an hour routine. It doesn't matter if you've never watched someone else's special. All that matters is that you have enough things at your immediate disposal to build upon. You have enough resources. So you have to ask yourself, what are the resources I do have? Not what are the resources that I don't have? And you have to start using them in very unique and creative ways, which is where your real capacity to sit down with yourself or other people that you're close enough to that are talented, smart, and experienced to design your own version of things. This is where you come in, Srini, because this is where you talk about the mimicry epidemic <laughs> right. and, and the difference between having a map and a compass, yeah. right? So, so at that moment that you decide you're going to go down a new path, you're going to reinvent yourself. You have to be able to do it in, a, in your own unique way, mm -hmm. right from the start, right? Right from the start, you have to do it in your own unique way. You cannot then say to yourself, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to start an online business where I sell this ebook. Who else sells ebooks? Let me go learn everything that they're doing and do exactly what they're doing to sell my ebook. Mm -hmm. That is room that, that you're, you're just spelling disaster for yourself. Yeah. Absolute disaster for yourself. And what you're going to have is unnecessary suffering. And then I'm going to have to get upset <laughs> and we don't need that. Right. So, so you're asking yourselves, what resources do I have? I've got to get resourceful. Mm -hmm. And then you're saying, how am I going to do this in a unique and creative way? Block everything else out, right? Simple things like you and I, when we were designing the unmistakable creative website, we started looking at the about page and I said, I don't know who else has really good about pages. Go look at them right? Rookie mistake. Yeah. Rookie mistake. <laughs> For a 20 year experience entrepreneur, I just basically stabbed myself with a sword and committed Harry Carey, right? No, don't go look at what everyone else does on their about page. That's a disaster. No, you and I, and finally I caught myself and I said to you, dude, what are we doing? You and I are two capable, creative human beings. And we're basically just going to mimic someone else. Yeah. Disastrous, right? So we stopped. We regrouped and we started getting creative. And then boom, we had a freaking cartoon mm -hmm. as the about page, beautifully designed that I've never seen on the internet before. So, you know, it, it, it could be as little as that, or it could be as, as big as, you know, deciding that you're going to do something crazy, like, you know, land a rocket ship in the place that it took off. Right. Mm -hmm. So, but you have to use your own creativity. You can't rely on others. Uh, now there's two other things that you need to do. One, you have to start the process of transition. You do not reinvent yourself overnight. It's a process of transition. And it's a delicate process depending on how vulnerable and how shattered you were from the previous experience, that, per, that, that temporary circumstance. So you cannot expect of yourself to just flip a switch. This is not a flip a switch type scenario. This is a process. And it goes in three phases. The first is you have to let go of things. You cannot reach a new place without letting go of the current place you're at. You, you know, and I use that, that kind of example you've always seen in the front of the room or on the stage where I'm at one end of the stage and I'm holding on mm -hmm. and I reach out to try to get to the other edge of the end of the stage, right? 
I, I don't have go-go gadget arms, right? So I have to let go to walk to the other end of the stage. That's what you have to do if you're reinventing yourself. You have to let go. You have to decide I'm no longer a baker. That's a tough thing to do, but it's necessary to let go of that to reinvent yourself. So to make sure that temporary circumstances doesn't, doesn't become a permanent reality, if that phase of your life is truly over, let go. Let go of the relationship, let go of the job, let go of the persona, let go of the Twitter account or the Facebook page, let go of the, the parents, if you're, you know, if you're too attached to them. Whatever you are attached to that you know with certainty will prevent you from reaching the new thing, you have to let go. Mm-hmm. And that's one of the toughest things for a human being to do. Because we become so attached to labels and consistency and comfort and those attachments, those attachments, those are, you cannot go any further than that which you are attached to. You just can't. Mm. So if you want to go to a new place, let go. Yeah. Now, now here's the problem. When you let go, it is almost impossible to grab on to the final thing that you're trying to get to right away, right? Mm-hmm. You want to go to this new place, but that takes time and money and experiences and people and energy. And so it's so scary because what is inevitable is you are about to enter the world of ambiguity. Mm -hmm. And the world of ambiguity sucks. (laughs) Like That's the worst place in the world to be because we can't defend ourselves and we can't you know, pop our head back underneath the turtle shell and we can't protect ourselves. We're all of a sudden uneducated, inexperienced, not skilled, vulnerable, fragile. We're all the things we're trying everything to avoid. (laughs) All those things, all simultaneously, right? Whether you think of, 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 um, you know, somebody that has gone through a very traumatic experience and has legitimately experienced post-traumatic stress syndrome, or you're thinking of something like Ira Glass when he talks about when you're first starting out doing something creative, you suck at it. Mm -hmm. You just do. And you have to, you know, fight through that knowing that there's something better on the other side. Whatever the, the, the degree with which you're playing in that transitionary space and that ambiguous space, it's scary. It doesn't matter if you're, if you're somebody that has talent and knowledge and experience, or if you're somebody that doesn't, when you're in that vulnerable place of transition, it's frightening. Mm-hmm. It just is, right? So what you have to do before you can get to the thing that you are trying to get to is you have to do a few different things. One, you have to put up temporary structures, right? You have to put up things around you that you define, very clearly, specifically define as temporary. And then you have to slowly dismantle them over time. So temporary structures might be, I'm going to mimic pieces of things that other people are doing because they're helping me get through this transitionary phase. So, you know, you you might say to yourself, well, my favorite runner wears this pair of running shoes. I'm going to wear the same running shoes, right? You're not going to wear the running shoes because you're going to get the results they're going to get. You're going to wear the running shoes because it gives you just a little bit of comfort as a temporary structure. But eventually you're going to shed those running shoes and you're going to have your own running shoes that are yours, that you own, that you believe in, that get you the win, right? But temporarily you're going to wear their running shoes or temporarily you're going to spend a little bit more time with whomever, mm-hmm. or temporarily you're going to need your friends to lean on just a little bit more than you normally do. Whatever those temporary structures are for you, or temporarily you're going to watch a show on Netflix every night before you go to bed, because if you sleep, if you try to go to sleep with your own thoughts, you're going to be in some deep, dark places. So you're just going to watch Parks and Rec every night. But the thing is, they have to be temporary. You have to define them as temporary in your mind. You have to structure them as temporary in your mind. And you have to eventually shed them over time, right? So you don't watch Parks and Recs every night. You only watch it on the nights that you're really, really struggling. Something like that, right? You slowly temporarily take them away because those structures are important to human beings because humans are fragile. So those structures give us comfort. 
but they need to be shed over time in a very clear and appropriate way. Now, if you don't build temporary structures, inevitably what you will do, depending on your type of personality, is you will turn to some very bad things instead. Mm -hmm. You will drink a lot. You will gamble. You will do drugs. You will hang out with people that you know aren't going to get you to where you want to go. You will, you will start to take antidepressants. You will um, find yourself doing things that you don't do, wouldn't do, if you weren't in such a fragile state of mind. And so rather than having those things aid you and cope and mask and hide the experience that you're going through, you need to create a safe place. And by creating those temporary structures, you create a safe space. Now, this is all to varying degrees, right? Some people are like, I'm tough. I can fight through this. I can do this. I, I don't need, you know, I don't need to lean on friends or cry every night or whatever, right? So they're going to be able to have temporary structures that are going to be a little more easier to control or manage. Some of us are very fragile. That's just how we're born. That's how our brains are wired. We're going to need deeper structures, right? Whatever the case is, find what's appropriate for you, but define them as temporary, shed them over time as you're getting closer and closer to your goals and closer and closer to the new identity that you're shaping. Mm -hmm. It's that ambiguity space that is the most difficult to navigate. So what happens for most of us is we never let go where we let go very briefly and we go right back, right? We go right back to the ex-boyfriend. We go right back to living in the same situation that we were before. We go right back to defaulting to the same vices. You know, we stop the smoking for two weeks, three weeks, four weeks, then we go back, et cetera, et cetera. So, um, you know, consider that idea that if you really want to shape your identity, it's a long process of navigating this, uh, you know, in, in many phases and many steps, don't just try to jump off, uh, off the cliff and, and build the parachute on the way down. Yeah. Well, I think that in a lot of ways, uh, really describes kind of the process of how we've arrived at, at what we've built so far with unmistakable creative, you know, getting to publish books with the publisher, all of that. I mean, that's mm-hmm. years in the making and, you know, it's interesting you're, you're talking about labels and at the beginning of, of the year, you know, Brian and I always would have some very tough conversations, you know, because we were just in such a situation. And, you know, it's weird because I was even just writing about this idea of labels and how limiting our labels can be. It's like, you know, podcaster, author, surfer, whatever. And what what was interesting, uh, you know, in, in the conversations I had with Brian, he said is he said your entire identity has been defined by this business. And he said, and that's really dangerous. Mm -hmm. And he said, and your sense of self-worth is fluctuating. He said, the one thing that you haven't really talked about is how much you love surfing or, or, you know, he said that part of your identity has pretty much been shed. And amazingly enough, it was doing that more that, that got back to you. I mean, you talked about varying degrees of, of, you know, issues. I mean, I, I was, I think I've talked about this before. Like I was at the point where I was sleep deprived for three months straight. Like I literally was waking up every single night with right. heart palpitations. It was like, and Brian finally said, he said, dude, he's like, you're sick. He said, mm-hmm. you're physically ill. I've seen you on the beach in pictures. He said, go see your doctor. This is ridiculous. Right. Um, and you know, I mean, it took taking medication to, to get to a point of normalizing, but it's like you said, it's, it's varying degrees, but the big, thing really is, is this idea of labels and, you know, we were label labels and ambiguity were the two things, you know, that we were one, my entire identity was labeled by whatever was happening with the business. Mm -hmm. And then the other was the amount of ambiguity that we were dealing with at the beginning of the year. I mean, there were so many open loops in the business. And he said, he said, here's the thing. He said, until these loops are closed, you're going to feel this immense amount of anxiety. And he said, in our job right now, he said, he said, the entire business and your entire life is one giant open loop. And our job for the next six weeks is to close all of them up. Yeah. I think that's a valid, uh, you know, way to look at that. Now, I think it's important to distinguish if you're running a business, your business has to have an identity, right? You know, or if, if you are a service professional, Mm -hmm. you have to have an identity. Because human beings work in mental models, right? So, so we, we, we identify things in relation to other things. That's how the human mind works. Yeah. So, so that's very important. You as a human being have to be careful about just how deeply tied you are to certain identities mm-hmm. because that's when you start screwing your life up. Uh, and, and that's when you start attaching your self-worth to other things that, that, that you don't have control over. So those are two very distinguishing th- factors. You know, I, I, I run a lot of businesses. I've built a lot of businesses 
and I'm always very clear in those businesses about who we are. Mm -hmm. But me as a person, I've been afforded the luxury in my adult life to have great success, you know, phenomenal success, which also gives me, affords me the luxury to make sure that in the public's eye, I don't have to be anybody to anything. Right. And, and I realize that not everybody has that. So a lot of people have to be identified as certain things and they have to go through the process of identification and re-identification and reinvention. So, so uh, just for a point of clarification, what you're really saying is, is you personally mm. were so wrapped up in the identity associated with your business oh, yeah. that you were losing your own self-worth and your own value based on how the vi- business was fluctuating. And that's when it gets dangerous. Yeah, yeah, yeah no doubt. Right now, our lives are on our phones. And with our phones full of live-streamed exercise classes, midday work calls, and nightly family video calls, there's no room for fraud calls. Thankfully, AT&T makes customer security a priority, helping block those pesky calls. It's not complicated. AT&T Active Armor, 24-7 proactive network security and fraud call blocking to help stop threats at no extra charge. Compatible device slash service required. Visit att.com slash active armor for details. Um, man, there's still so much stuff I want to ask you about. Well, I mean, you mentioned success and I think this is a perfect time to talk about, uh, another conversation that I've wanted to have with you for a very long time. And, and we've, we've had this conversation on and off, but never in a lot of depth. Yeah. You know, this is something I've asked a lot of people, uh, especially over the last six months as I've had people here who've had varying degrees of success. One of the things that really interests me is people's internal narrative around money. And what I'm more interested in more than anything is that Growing up poor and amassing wealth, how has that changed your internal narrative around money? And what, what, what impact does people's internal narrative around money have on their lives? Well, I think it starts out with the difference between in, informed and defined by. So you're very good um, at uh, using experiences to inform and shape your belief system and your actions. And you've been very cognizant over recent years to be very careful about using those experiences to define who you are and what you do. And I think that's an important element. And what I mean by that is, is as a child, I grew up very poor in my early ages, as I mentioned, and, and, and it was my identity, right? I was poor. Mm-hmm. Like that was my identity. I lived, I, I was in a family that had nothing. That was my identity, right? So, so early on, I had experiences that demonstrated to me that I was poor. And the reason I had those experiences is because a, a part of that was obviously just the struggle of things like my friends had a bedroom. I shared a bedroom with my brother and my sister, right? Like you have an experience like that and you realize, hmm, Everyone else has their own bedroom. Mm -hmm. I share a bedroom with my brother and my sister. This is different. Why is this different? Oh, we don't have money, right? So you have these experiences. Or I remember one time a $10 bill blew out of the window of, of our car. And my mom and I searched for what seemed like 45 minutes to find that $10 bill. And that's a vivid experience of my childhood. And my mom still talks about it and how funny it was now looking back. But at the time, that $10 bill was so precious, right? Mm-hmm. Which is not ironic that I started a project called $10 in the left. <laughs> I've had, uh, but I've had opposite experiences too. So at some point, we lived in a home that was in a very poor neighborhood, but it was on the border of a very rich neighborhood. And so I went to school in a very affluent school district. The type of school district where kids have Mercedes before they're capable of driving, Mm -hmm. you know, that kind of stuff. The type that, you know, I have, I have celebrity friends as a result of growing up in that neighborhood. Now, what was interesting about that is everything shapes you, but it can be taken in either direction. So I would go over to friend's house who literally hosted rodeos in their backyard when they drained their pond or had nine whole golf courses and we would drive around in golf carts. These are real homes, right? Like personal residences that seem like resorts to me, right? So I would have these experiences. Now that can go one of two ways, right? So that experience could shape me in the fact of like, I'll never have that. I'm jealous of that. I'm envious of that. Or it could shape me in the ways of like, man, I want to have this someday. I hope to have this someday. How do I get this someday? 
And what was most interesting about those experiences to me, I feel fortunate that the experiences as a poor person that I had with rich people were so generous to me personally that it re it informed my way of thinking about money. So I had experiences where I had friends whose parents bought me things like literal, like, like important items, right? Like, Greg, what are you going to wear on the first day of school? Uh, I don't know, whatever my brother wore last year, right? To no, 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 no. Let's take you shopping. Right. And then they would take me shopping. Those are the types of experiences I've had with rich people. Experiences like, you know, uh, great. You walk to school every day and all your friends ride bikes. Do you want a bike? You know, like, like experiences like that all the way up into adulthood. Right. So when I said, when I was 19, I met this couple where they knew the circumstances I had and they knew how hard I was working for them, where they would say, Hey, Greg, why don't you, you know, we know you're not going to eat dinner tonight. Why don't you come over to our place? We'll make you dinner. So I feel incredibly fortunate that the, the money experiences that I had with rich people were of the generous nature. You know, if you watch the news, you would think that very, very wealthy people are simply not generous. And of course, some of them aren't, right? But very, there's some very, very poor people that are also not generous, mm-hmm. right? And so, so we get shaped by these narratives around us and our experiences. And so partly, I just feel fortunate. I had rich people experiences that were kind, compassionate, and generous. And what happened by having that is I started to shape my own opinions about money. So two things would happen. I would be around my mother and around my mother's friends and around my relatives, and they would have very angry, sad, envious experiences around mother. My mother hates rich people, right? So it's very hard to know that and to go out and make a lot of money as a son. (laughs) You know, it's like, by definition, does that mean she's going to hate me? So I have all these experiences where I have so many negative experiences on one side and then so many positive experiences on the other that rather than being defined by them, I allowed them to shape me in ways that I could make up my own mind and draw my own conclusions. And that's what we all need to do about everything, but money in particular Mm -hmm. is Use experiences to help shape you in ways that you get to, you know, define your own belief system around money. Don't just accept others' opinions of money. And I mean that on both sides, right? Don't read a Tony Robbins book and say to yourself, well, that's my opinion on money. Mm -hmm. Don't read Susie Orman or Dave Ramsey and just go, well, that's my opinion on money. Yeah. But also, if you have the other, you know, experiences, if if you grew up poor or you've had bad experiences with rich people being mean or jerks, don't just have those experiences and then go, well, that's my opinion about money. Yeah. Really, truly be thoughtful enough to explore all of that and then start shaping your own opinion. What is my opinion? And I don't think we do that enough. I don't think we do that with money or anything else. I don't think we sit around and go, wait a minute, what is my opinion? And do I have this opinion because that's actually my opinion? Mm-hmm. Or do I have this opinion because someone else told me to have that opinion? Yes. And I think for me, I was fortunate enough to have enough profound experiences. And also, I think it's just my nature to make everything deep mm-hmm. that I was thoughtful enough to explore it personally, where I said to myself, well, what my mother's going through, I know I don't want that. And what these rich people are going through, these generous rich people are going through, I kind of like that. No. Yeah. I'm going to try to go after that. And then I started down the path of what I described earlier, right? So I decided, how could I do that? What do I, what am I talented and gifted at? Okay. Where do I have advantages? What's probable and what's possible? Like, so I did all the things that I talk about now. I just didn't do them in such a formulaic way then, of course, but my my opinions on money are very deep and I have a lot of them, but that's, that's the starting place for if you want to, in my opinion, if you want to define your relationship with money, you actually have to have an opinion of it first. 
your own opinion. You know, it's interesting because I think we're talking about a lot more than money. Uh, of course. The, and, you know, the thing that it, it takes me back to is uh, college, amazingly enough, you know, being at Berkeley and uh, pedigree was a big deal where I went to college. Like, mm-hmm. you know, people talked about working at Goldman Sachs or working at McKinsey or Bain or, you know, all these things, all these things that were basically no shot in the hell of happening for me with my GPA. <laughs> and yet those were the things that, and, you know, it was like forcing square pegs into round holes, trying to fit in and thrive within that system where I knew I'd never succeed. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, to me, that's the difference between possibility and probability, right? So you're, you're playing a game. Could it be possible that you could work at one of those players? Of course you have, you're smart. You're going to a good school. Of course it's possible. Is it probable? No. And it's not not probable because you're not. No. (laughs) Well, right. But it's, but, but why do you have that GPA though? You have that GPA because you're doing things that you don't want to be doing. Yeah, exactly. (laughs) You know, you know, uh, I want to ask you uh, about formative people in your life and lack of them. Uh, two questions. Tom. What has been the impact on your life uh, of having no father figure and a father leaving? I think that's a, a, a very important question that I haven't explored nearly enough until about a year ago, yeah. actually. Um, I don't know. I, I, I know I've explored myself enough and I've uh, made sure that I could invite really good people into my life to give me candid feedback enough that I know not having a father figure and having one who literally just up and left and told my mother she would never succeed and the children would never succeed um, has had profound effects on my capacity to have intimacy with people. It's really interesting that I could literally sit in your living room and we could talk about anything and everything. But in the end, I want to go home to my living room, Mm -hmm. right? Like I want to close myself off. I can open myself up incredibly vulnerably to strangers. I mean, you saw me at the instigator experience, right? I mean, those are strangers in, by and large in that room. And I shared a talk with them that <laughs> could not have been more vulnerable in a lot of ways personally. Uh, yet, if any one of those people were to say, you know, let me care for you, mm-hmm. I'd shut it down instantly. So I know that that stems from the lack of father and from, an, you know, abandonment and, you know, those, those, those formative early childhood experiences. I know that it does. So I, I know that it has an impact on that. I, I, I think it's also had an impact on uh, early on in, in my adulthood. It had a great impact on whether or not I would have kids mm-hmm. and my capacity to believe in myself as potentially being uh, a good father. You know, there, there was a period of my time where I, of, of my adult life where I just felt like, you know, uh, I don't know that I, I, I think I'm born too much like my dad. And that scares me in relation to children because I would never want to abandon a child knowing what that experience is like. So, you know, I know it shaped me in, in not having children in my early adulthood year or, you know, not pursuing a relationship in a very specific way to have in ultimately having children. So I know that that's happened. I also think that there's been uh, very um, nervous and a tremendous amount of anxiety around being a successful personality to the public. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> because interestingly enough, you know, my father was very abusive to my mother and he was an alcoholic and he abandoned my mother, you know, shortly after my sister, my sister was one when he left, I was five, my brother was nine. And, you know, to leave three children at that early age and to completely just disappear, like he just, you know, gone. I saw him one time after that, he actually tried to kidnap me. And that's a whole nother story. <laughs> um, you know, I saw him one time after that, where he literally, it, it, my, my uncle had to introduce me to him at my grandmother's funeral. I had no idea who he was, and he had no idea who I was, which is, you know, I mean, that's not the experience you want to have with your father. So, you know, when I was in high school, 
my dad actually became famous. And he became famous in a very weird way in that he became famous because he had his identity stolen. And at the time he had his identity stolen, it was a very uncommon thing because we had just been entering the digital age. So you didn't have all these digital information that you could steal, like credit card information and records and everything else. The internet was just coming to life. And because of that, he happened to have his identity stolen in a way that was, it was uh, very significant. And um, he started showing up everywhere because of it, because he pursued the fact that it was not a felony at that time to steal someone's identity. It was actually not, it was a misdemeanor crime. And so he had to try to get his identity back. Well, the reason he had his identity stolen was actually because he was intentionally doing things to avoid paying child support, which is never told in the story. That is never shared in any of the stories that have ever been told about how he got his identity stolen, which to me, you know, I'm thinking about my mother, of course, and I'm thinking about the fact that he's abandoned my mother and he's abandoned his three children. And he doesn't communicate with them. He doesn't talk to them. He's had his identity stolen because he's avoid paying child support. And now here he is a victim, Right. So he's on every show imaginable, Today Show, Good Morning America, 48 Hours, every show. He's in every newspaper, the cover of the Arizona Republic, the cover of the USA Today, everywhere. And he's on these, in these papers and on these programs because he's a victim. And everyone in my life is pointing this out to me. Now, keep in mind, I have zero communication with my father, my friends, my teachers, my neighbors, did you see your dad was on today's show today? Did you see your dad was in the newspaper today? Right. So, so I'm getting, I'm fielding that as a teenager in high school. While I'm fielding that, I'm thinking about my mother and the fact that here she has been a real victim for decades, getting nothing, working her ass off to make sure three kids make it to adulthood somewhat reasonably. And he's the victim. And on, in addition, he starts pursuing, uh, you know, repairing his identity. And he does it in a way where he starts becoming the hero. So he files lawsuits. He involves attorneys. He involves the government, the Arizona government, all the way up to the point where he gets Senator John McCain to uh, pitch a law, literally called the Hartle Law, to Congress to make it a felony to have your identity stolen. He goes to Congress. He's speaking before Congress, my father. He's on every show again with a book. He's selling the book on how to protect your identity. He's a best-selling author, right? I'm watching this all unfold in high school. No conversations with me, no, no interaction with me. I'm watching this all unfold. Now my father is not only a victim, he's a celebrity. He's a hero. He's making it a felony to get your identity stolen. And now you can pursue it criminally. And now you can get your identity back by reading his book. And you're going to be great. And everything's going to be okay. I'm watching this unfold. And I really believe that has had a tremendous effect on me not wanting to be in the public's eye. Because something about that experience where I believe that he is borderline sociopathic in his actions and behaviors and the fact that he has shown zero emotion to the fact that he has an entire family in which he's abandoned, the fact that he has inevitably made it almost impossible for them to succeed financially, despite the fact that he's a very successful engineer, financially well off, uh, eventually later on in his life after, you know, my parents got a divorce and here he is a hero. Right. And so I have had the experience of having that unfold at an early enough age for me where I have been concerned about my capacity to not become that. I have incredible anxiety around somehow me getting into the zeitgeist and into the bubble, because I've seen it happen, not just to my father. I've seen it happen to people you and I know. Mm -hmm. I've seen it happen to other celebrities that are on television. 
Dr. Oz being a good example to me, one of the foremost surgeons in our country who is now shelling out garbage for the sake of attention and notoriety and money. And I see that unfold and I'm nervous. I'm scared that that's going to become me. That in my own DNA, it happened. And that that might be possible that I become that. And so, you know, it's kind of this confluence of abandonment turned, I have zero compassion for you Mm -hmm. and care to I'm now a celebrity and getting all sorts of attention and I still don't care and money and still don't care what happens to you and your family. And I just... I protect against that so much that I protect against that to a fault. Wow. Have you ever had any contact with him since? None. None at all. I've never even tried. Hmm. And I don't know if I will. Uh, I've certainly explored it. It's interesting, you know. My brother has had tremendous difficulty. And that might be just because he was, you know, just old enough. Mm Mm-hmm. Uh, still to this day, he has incredible depression and other difficulty around, you know, the uh, being abandoned like that. My sister was young enough where she just doesn't even know. Like she has curiosity. And then somehow I've just fallen in the middle. I, I just live my life. And it just, it, it, honestly, it just doesn't even come up most of the times. When it comes up, is there in situations like this? And then I really reflect on it. And, you know, I do wonder if I would ever, um, do anything about it. But up to this point, that's one area of, of my life. It, it, you know, being such an explorer and an experimenter, that is certainly one area of my life that obviously has a dramatic impact on, on me deep down inside because I've never explored or experimented in that area. Wow. So <clears throat> I have one other question about a formative relationship in your life, and then I want to shift gears a little bit and we'll start wrapping things up. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's about the people who the couple that came into your life. Remember when you told me about them, because that never came up in any of our earlier conversations. I mean, for those of you guys who don't know, this is Greg's third appearance on the podcast, not counting all the backstage episodes that are in our archives where we were dissecting interviews together. Uh, And in some form or another, I've asked this to a lot of people. Do you think that when people like that come into our lives, that we can recognize them or only recognize their impact in retrospect? I will answer that from my personal perspective. For me, I recognized they were having an impact on my life when it was unfolding. I didn't realize until I got older just how profound it was Mm -hmm. and, and, and how deep that impact was. But while it was unfolding, I knew because I kept having these like aha moments that were reshaping me in real time, you know, in a lot of ways they saved me. Mm -hmm. I was a 19 year old kid that didn't know what I was going to do with my life. Didn't care from one day to the next, what happened, had no direction, no education, no wherewithal of whatever was going to happen. Right. So they saved my life in a lot of ways. And 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 taught me how to be a responsible, respectable, contributing member to society. But they didn't teach me by teaching me. They taught me by including me. Mm-hmm. And that was all the difference in the world because I was a very aggressive, intense, defiant human being at that time. And before that time, you know, I didn't go to school. I didn't go to class. I didn't care. And I was able to get away with a lot of that because I have a relatively high IQ and I'm talented at a lot of things. And so I was capable of getting away with a lot, you know, and, and the combination of me believing that I was in charge and not anyone else with, with, being smart enough to know how to manipulate and navigate things to my advantage, it wasn't serving me. It was causing a lot of harm to my life. So if they had told me what to do 
or told me what was wrong with me or tried to teach me lessons, Mm -hmm. it would have failed miserably. But for whatever reason, and I have no idea why, and, and I'm still friends with them and, and we still talk, but I've never actually asked them if that was intentional or not. But for whatever reason, they just included me. They included me in everything. You know, when I was, we would have circumstances where they would say, hey, we need a bank loan to keep this business going. Why don't you come down to the bank with us and talk to the banker, right? So I'm sitting there listening to them talk about interest rates and loans and, you know, uh, terms and all these banking terms where I'm like, what, (laughs) you know, what's going on here? You need a bank loan? What are you going to use it for? I don't know. You know, and I'm learning all this stuff where they would say, hey, we need to move into a new building. We have a real estate broker that's going to show us around. Let's take a road trip. Let's go see some offices. Or, hey, a very, very important client just emailed us with a very, very nasty email. Why don't you write up the response you would send and then we'll sit down and we'll talk about it, right? They were including me in things like that. And then it just kept going, right? So then they were including me like, hey, we're having a party and we've got some friends coming over on Saturday. Why don't you stop by? We know it's not your crowd and they're a lot older than you, but just stop by, just do it, just stop by, right? They were just able enough to nudge me, Mm -hmm where they were including me in the, I used to hate to read. I never read anything growing up. And my boss never told me to read anything, but he would come in. This is the same guy. He would come in. They started out as, as my boss, my boss is, and they became my mentors and then friends. He would come in and he would just drop a book off, not say a word. And I would literally take it from my desk and toss it in the corner. <laughs> that went on for probably a year and a half. He never said a word. He wasn't angry. He wasn't upset. He didn't demand I read it. Nothing. He just dropped it off. Every book you've ever read, Srini, he put in my office. I guarantee you, all the good ones. You know? <laughs> and then one day I just picked one up and took it home and read it. Yeah. And, and I was like, well, that's pretty good. I wonder if there's any other ones in there. And then I read another one and another one and another one and another, right? So what was very powerful and impactful for me was they included me in things that people like me don't get included in. Mm -hmm. And when you take someone who you see potential in and you start including them rather than telling them what they're doing wrong or even what they could do right, they actually just start adopting those things on their own. You know, if you if you want to look to a movie for this, look to Goodwill Hunting, mm-hmm. right? You know, when when Robin Williams takes Matt Damon and and stops trying to force him to have sessions, <laughs> right? But starts just including him as a peer, yeah, and talking about baseball and relationships and life instead of like, what's wrong with you, and why are you behaving that way, right? Yeah. All of a sudden, Matt Damon starts having different types of experiences and outcomes. The exact same thing happened to me. I just started having different types of experiences and outcomes because I saw potential and I saw options and I saw results and I saw, oh, okay. So if I were to write that, they would actually be more upset, (laughs) you know? And they're like, yeah, so don't say that. But hey, if you (laughs) said this instead, that'd probably work, you know? So it's guidance. Yeah. And I've tried to do that with other people in my life. And I hope I've done that with you. Oh, yeah. I, well, I, I have some things to say about that. You know, it, where I've tried to be more in, in, inclusive uh-huh. and, not, and not directly demanding. Yeah. And, and it's my experience that when you do that with people, they will, they will start to develop their own take on things mm-hmm. that fits their style and, and their personality and their gifts and then they'll start to shine, you know, and, and, and they'll start to blossom and they'll start to do things that you always knew they could do. And so, you know, when I say at the beginning that I made it my life's work to, to, to help people that are unnecessarily suffering, stop suffering. Mm-hmm. That's exactly how I've done that. You know, I didn't go to Ferguson and say, you people are idiots for rioting. I didn't go to Ferguson and say, I'm on your side. I'm an activist. Michael Brown shouldn't have been shot you know, screw the police. I didn't do either of those things. You know what I did? I went to Home Depot. <laughs> I bought buckets and, br- and brooms and spray paint. Uh-huh. 
And I went to the local businesses and I said, hey, I'm a local business owner too. Tell me about your business. What's going on? How are you going to get this place back open? Do you mind if I sweep up? You know, like that's how you get people that are unnecessarily suffering to stop suffering. Mm -hmm. You just do thoughtful things. And as a result, they just blossom. And that's, I think, what I learned from them most that later when I looked back, I realized, wow, like they had such a deeply profound impact on my life in ways that I just didn't realize. You know, they made me better, a better business person. Mm -hmm. They made me capable of a lot more. But it, but it, that wasn't really their contribution. Their contribution was the enduring aspect of their contribution. Their contribution was the ripple effect, right? It was the effect they had on me that was so great that unconsciously I was having a similar effect on, on other people to the point where I finally consciously recognized that and made it a purposeful uh, uh, made it my life's purpose to have that impact. That's pretty profound. I mean, you don't find people like that in your life very often. No, no, not at all. It's interesting. I mean, it, it, it's funny because it, there's so many parallels in that story uh, to the relationship that you and I have. Uh, you know, I mean, we met on Twitter of all places mm-hmm. years ago when I remember you were six weeks into $10 in a laptop. Oh. I was like, this guy sounds completely insane <laughs> and I need to get to know him. And it was like, you know, you must be the res- most resourceful human being I know. And it's interesting because I think one of the the things that, uh, and I, I, this is fresh on my mind because I just finished wrapping the chapter on mastery and the role of mentors and coaches and how <clears throat> there comes a point at which uh, the people, you know, the, the analogy I said is it's kind of like the, the soft top foam surfboard that they teach you how to surf on. It's great for standing up on a board consistently and balancing and making mm-hmm. sure you don't fall off, but it lacks a lot of things like maneuverability and flexibility. So when you're done with that, they graduate you to the real board and that's when style starts to come in mm-hmm. and you look at sort of mentors and coaches as, as training wheels. And what's interesting is I, I think there was a point somewhere in our dynamic where it it actually got unhealthy to a point of dependency in which I was not making decisions on my own. And, you know, it's funny when we released the compass, uh, I remember I, you know, it came out on my birthday. I said to Brian, I said, you know what? I said, this is the first unmistakable creative project that doesn't have Greg's fingerprints on it at all. Mm. I said, Mm -hmm. but the interesting thing is a lot of the things that you taught me are unconsciously a part of it. Of course. Of course. Yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's very important that the people that are shaping your life, you don't become dependent upon them mm-hmm. to shape your life, you know? And, and it's very important that if you are helping shape others' lives, that you are consciously aware of when that's happening. That goes for people that you're close to, whether it's your children or your parents or your business partners. But that also goes to the people you do business with. Mm -hmm. If you're selling a product online or you have a a popular blog, I believe it's your responsibility to make sure that those people do not become dependent upon you. Yeah. I think that's an important element and I think it's often overlooked because that dependency creates a feeling inside of you when they are giving you that dependency. It creates a feeling inside of you of, of, of worth, right? Mm-hmm. And so it's dangerous. It's, it's, it's easy for you as a producer of that type of work to want more of that, mm-hmm. you know, more fuel of, on the fire, right? Become more dependent, more dependent, more dependent, more of you, more of you, more of you. And you lose a sense of your own self and you also start becoming harmful to them. And I think it's important that, you know, in, in our situation, we did not recognize it fast enough, but we did recognize it. Yeah. And we fixed it. And it was important that we did, and 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 you've produced good work since. Well, it's it's such a you know it, it's such a complicated thing because I, I think you bring up a really important point about uh, dependency and responsibility, and and you know I mean we, we created this sort of putting people on a pedestal mm-hmm. uh, mentality. I remember somebody asked me about the instigator experience. You know, do you feel? you know, ready to lead this group of people. And I said, I think that's actually really dangerous for anybody Mm -hmm. to look to me for that because I said at most I could guide, but I think, you know, placing, I think that the danger is that there's two things that happen with this dependency. One is that you suddenly, the idea that you're responsible for the consequences and results of what happens in people's lives, it's a heavy burden. 
Mm -hmm. Uh, Mm -hmm. You know, when, when somebody tells me I quit my job because of your work, I'm like, Mm -hmm. shit, I hope that goes okay. Yeah. yeah. You know, like, it's right. Because you're kind of like, wait a minute, did I cause that? And, you know, and it's something I've I've thought a lot about in the process of writing a book. I'm like, okay, there, there's a level of responsibility as an author to say, by the way, I've made it a big, big point to say my, my advice is a compass, not a map. Please don't follow it to the letter. (laughs) Right. You know, I'm like, how could you follow my example? I'm like, if I told you, by the way, go get fired from every job you've ever been at and you'll get a book deal. That would be bullshit. Yeah. Well, you know, I feel the same way. And that's why I'm always hesitant when you ask me these questions where I always yeah. start with, well, I'm not sure I'm qualified <laughs> to answer that question because I think it's dangerous. You know, you can take, you know, take the Bruce Lee model. I always feel like the Bruce Lee model is the best, right? You know, take what you think is valuable, discard what you think is don't and make what you want uniquely, uniquely your own. Mm-hmm. Right. And I, I think that's a great way to take in information and advice and guidance, right? So some of it's going to apply, some of it's not going to apply. Uh, and, and some of it you need to make your own Mm -hmm. and, and that's valuable. That's why we read books or read blogs or buy products or listen to podcasts, et cetera. Mm -hmm. If you just take it all and and apply it all and, and, and take it as gospel, you're entering dangerous territory, uh, both for you and for the person delivering it. And, and unfortunately, because this stuff isn't governed, Mm -hmm. it's not governed. It's, you know, there, there's no regulation. Um, we have to do that ourselves and it's incumbent upon us to help each other do that. Mm no matter which side of that, that equation we're on. Yeah. Well, I want to finish, uh, with one final part of this conversation. I think one that a lot of people are probably curious about who know you, um, and kind of know what was going on with you. One of the things we haven't ever talked about throughout this conversation, even though we've been talking for two and a half hours, uh, are your health issues. Mm -hmm. Uh, that have been sort of a, a, an integral part of all of this. Uh, so I I think one, you know, for people who have no context, it might help to fill them in a little bit. Yeah. (laughs) Um, this is interesting because I've been attempting over the last 18 months to figure out how to navigate this in a more appropriate fashion, because I don't think I was handling my health circumstances very well, uh, personally, Mm. professionally or publicly. And, um, what was required. So, so, so let me, let me state the, the groundwork here. And then let me tell you what that experience has been like. Unfortunately, I have a life threatening illness and my life-threatening illness is, is related to my kidneys and a kidney transplant, in fact, that I received 11 years ago. Um, the, the unfortunate part about it is that technically it's a terminal illness. The fortunate part about it is there are ways in which I can prolong my life for whom knows how long, but... I can prolong my life and get some of my health back, which I've been working really hard at in the last 18 months. But nonetheless, I have an illness that is a very serious illness that is on my mind every moment of every day and is something that I'm navigating every moment of every day. And it's difficult. It's it's emotionally difficult. It's physically difficult. It's mentally difficult. And it also is relationally difficult in many ways. And what I recognized last summer, a year ago, just a little over a year ago, is I wasn't managing it well. I, 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 my life was chaotic. And my life, by and large, has not been chaotic. I, I'm an organized person. I, I'm... I'm uh, very focused. I'm producing, you know, by and large, great results consistently. And I realized just how chaotic my life was last summer. And I realized that uh, how I was navigating, it, it, and it was all the result of how I was navigating this illness. And one of the things I realized is, is that I had too much chaos in my relationships around me. And so I 
built temporary structures that, that allowed me to go really quiet and really calm. Mm -hmm. So I created a living situation that is really quiet and really calm. I, I stopped talking to a lot of people that wouldn't be good for me if I were trying to create an environment that was quiet and calm. I, I stopped communicating with the public by and large, uh, almost completely. Uh, I stopped doing a lot of things digitally and I don't just mean like social media. I mean, I stopped checking email and answering email or, uh, I, I committed to being on my phone no more than, uh, uh, or having my phone on me no more than half the day. Um, you know, I, I took some steps to really create quiet and calm and peacefulness in my life. And I took some steps to start doing things that I've always loved to do that were not part of what was defining me publicly. And that was really hard to do because a lot of people were looking to me to participate. Mm -hmm to communicate, to talk to, to get advice from, to, to do things, to share things, to build things. And by and large, I have the tendency to want to help. And uh, it was very painful for me to kind of go dark, if you will. But it was also necessary. And as part of that process, what else was necessary is for me to come to grips with my illness um, in a holistic way. And I don't mean come to grips as in, you know, Greg, you're dying. Mm-hmm. I, I mean, come to grips in a way that if I were to die, that I would die well. You know, I started having the conversation with myself, Greg, if you were to die, how would you ensure that you died well? And that's an interesting question to explore because in conclusion, what I determined is, well, the way you die well is to live well. Because when you die, you will have lived and lived well, and so you will be at peace. And so I started digging into very clear things in my life where, thing, where they were unsettled, mm -hmm. when they were not, where they were not at peace or where they were not whole, whether it be a relationship, a business, a project, an idea, um, whatever it might be. And I started figuring out ways to make them whole, but make them whole in a way that was enjoyable to me, not whole as in, you know, I have this relationship with this person and it hasn't gone well and I feel bad about it. And so I'm going to do everything I have to do to make sure they like me. Mm -hmm. Not like that, but, but, but in ways that I thought would be, I could navigate them in fun, interesting, intriguing ways for myself. So it could have been anything, right? So one of the things I realized was, is I was having a real hard time with the idea that I couldn't use my body. I've been an athlete my entire life, a, a professional athlete, actually, for a brief period of time. I've, you know, competed in so many different sports. And even as an adult, you know, I've, I've done a triathlon, a marathon, six half marathons. You know, I've done a lot of things physically. And now my body was incapable of doing any of those things. And I realized that, you know, one thing I needed to do was, was be whole with the idea that my body couldn't be what it used to be and find ways that I could use my body today in productive ways. Well, I like woodworking. I can still do woodworking, right? So, so I built myself a desk. I built myself a drawing table. I built myself a media center. I built myself a bed. I built myself, you know, I just started building things. And that I could physically do because it wasn't training. I could take all the time in the world to do and, and do them in a way that was meaningful to me. So I was finding these things in my life that were not whole. Another one was my relationship with my mother, where my mom would do anything for me and I would do anything for my mom. And it was a great relationship. But what we didn't have is there's a ton of stuff unsaid. So I asked her, I said, mom, would you be willing to have a conversation with me every single week at the same day and the same time? And we would record it. And I would ask you all the things I've never asked you. And you would ask me all the things you've never asked me. And we would just put them on the table. And that way, one, we had a better relationship. And two, if I were to die, you would have an archive of recordings of incredibly meaningful conversations between us. And see, what you realize is, or what I realized is, is like, I'm doing this because I'm saying to myself, well, I'm dying and I might die soon, but 
But actually what I realized was, it's like, if I was dying or not, this is amazing. Mm-hmm. I'm having conversations with my mom I should have had 10 years ago. And I'm recording them so that both of us can listen back to them. Anytime we you know, want the warm and fuzzies of each other, I'll be there. Like if I pass away before she does, my voice will be there. She'll have countless hours of listening to us talk, right? Like that's, why not do that? Why not create situations in your life that you're living well? You're living in ways that are incredibly meaningful to you, even in small ways. Like there's, there's no public accolades for that, mm-hmm. but it's awesome and fun and engaging and interesting and, and, you know, I learn a lot, et cetera. So when I've gone through this, this, this health challenge, I, I, I really realized that at first I was just saying, well, my time's up. See ya. And I realized that that's not, that's not the way I want to go out. That, that my life has a lot more worth to it than that. And that I want to be at a much deeper level of peace than that. And so I wanted to start doing the things that, that made me feel like I was going to die well. And, and of course, the conclusion that I came to, for some, is probably an obvious one, which is, well, live well mm-hmm. and you'll die well. You know? and, and so the last 18 months is, is, has been a lot of that. It's been a lot of, you, you know, I, I play tennis often now because I'm healthy enough to play tennis. It took a long time to get to that. Right. I remember when I first stepped on the tennis court, I cried. <laughs> I was there with my friend Vivek and I was like in tears. And he's like, dude, are you all right? And I'm like, dude, you don't understand. I haven't left the house in 45 days. I haven't gotten out of bed in 30. Like to hit a tennis ball, to see the sunshine, this is remarkable, you know? And I, I got myself to that place where I'm now working again and and, and exercising and things like that. And what I realized though, is that I'm really taking very deliberate care for the experience itself. So, you know, when I go play tennis, one of the things I do is I sweep the tennis courts first and it's not because it's Zen or spiritual, or I want to be cool and say, I sweep the tennis courts first. Like, you know, (laughs) you know, the Buddha does, but because it, it, it etches into my mind how significant this experience can be if I make it such and how peaceful and calm and, and rewarding it can be as well. Mm. And so I've really taken to heart the idea that I am going to strive some, for some pretty considerable accomplishments before I die, whenever that might be, but I am not going to do it at the expense of a life I know with absolute certainty that when I die, I will die well because I have lived well all the way up to the last day. Hmm. And that's what I've been committed to over the last 18 months. Wow. Um, So I have one question about this and I kind of knew this is where we'd end up and uh, we'll wrap things up after this. You know, as I heard you tell that story, my mind went to, you know, all the experiences that you and I have had together. Uh, And for some reason, it went to Randy Posh's last lecture, which I've seen (laughs) once or twice. And I can't help but wonder about this because it's something I've thought about a lot. Uh, As I've had all these conversations with people who have gone through, you know, sort of hellish experiences, what I call impact zone moments, especially facing death, right? I think that Death in particular is one of the more interesting ones because the idea that life is short and we should live fully and live well, you know, this stuff makes great cliches and great motivational Mm -hmm. posters. Mm -hmm. But you have an understanding of it that most of us never will. And I wonder if we can develop that understanding and that capacity and that appreciation for it without having the front row seat to death that you have. Yes. I. So one, no, not at certain deep levels. Yeah. No, you can't, you just can't. However, what I've learned through this process is what you really need to do, I believe as a human is you need to constantly have at the forefront, 
very particular questions that you're asking yourselves that you're asking yourself in those moments. Because if you're con- if you take the conscious time to ask yourself in that moment a good question, you will ensure a good outcome. Mm-hmm. And what I mean by that is is you know one of the things I did when I traveled around the country to all fifty states is I wrote down a question that I looked at every single day and memorized and asked myself, which was, if I were never in this exact scenario ever again, what would I do? Right now, what would I do? Because I knew that the majority of the things I was going to do, I would never have that opportunity to do again, right? Am I ever going to be in the badlands of South Dakota (laughs) on a summer day at the top of this rock with a lake underneath me? Is that ever going to happen again in my lifetime? Probably not. So if it never happens again in my lifetime, and this is the only time this is going to happen, what would I do? I'd jump into the lake. Well, then there's only one thing to do. Jump into the lake. And so just by simply having that question written down in my pocket, at the forefront of my head, everywhere I went, if I'm never going to be in this exact scenario ever again, what would I do? It allowed me to have the types of experiences that you're talking about. So I think it's a lot about asking questions. Here's another one that I learned. If you're on a date with someone, whether it's a first date or you've been married to them for 20 years and you go on a date, a good question to ask yourself is, if this were a first date, would you and I both want to have a second? Now, if you ask yourself that question, right when you left on the date, even if you were with somebody for 20 years, would it be like, likely that you would have a good date, that you would live well in that moment? It's likely you would. So to me, the way to overcome this idea of, you know, live every day as if it's your last and, you know, blah, 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 blah. Having all those things become cliches, the way you ensure that they don't is you come up with a good question to ask yourself in every scenario that allows you to say to yourself, well, if I wanted this date to be the type of date in which we both had a second, here's what I would do. And by asking yourself those types of questions, you create experiences that you don't take for granted and you, you don't just walk through it unconsciously. But that takes discipline and it does take work and it takes a commitment to do so. But ultimately, that's not that hard. It's not that hard to write down a question and put it in your pocket or have it on your phone as your background screen or whatever Mm -hmm. and just make that commitment. That's actually not that hard. And what you'll find is that the more that you do it, the more that I've done it at least, the more I do it, right? It just becomes a habit. And so when I go play tennis, I say to myself, you know, How can I make sure that this is a comfortable and peaceful experience for me today and not one in which I get frustrated, annoyed, uh, you know, at my tennis game? Well, I know what I'd do. I'd start by sweeping the court and making it clean and nice and peaceful. Second thing I would do is I would not yell out loud on anything that I do on this tennis court in a negative way. The third thing I would do is I would sweep the court when I'm done to prepare it for someone else. And by doing those three things, I have a better experience, right? But we have all the opportunity in the world to do that. We just choose not to. But we can do that when we're in our car, stuck in traffic. We can do that everywhere, right? We just have to be willing to ask ourselves a good question and then answer it in our actions. It's funny. You make me think about my surf sessions and maybe I should stop counting waves. (laughs) Give it a try. See what happens. Yeah. Well, this has been amazing. So I have one final question for you, sure. Uh, which is how we finish everything. What do you think it makes somebody or something unmistakable? Say that question again. What do you think makes somebody or something unmistakable? I think uh, I am not going to do this justice. <laughs> <laughs> the guy who so, came up with the name unmistakable creative is not going to do this question. No, no. Justice. The reason I'm not going to do this justice <laughs> is because I believe, you know, Bernie Shong, yeah. right? Okay. So Bernie is a friend of mine, someone I met during $10 in the laptop who I adore. 
I feel like Bernie had the best answer to this question, not being asked this direct question. I cannot recall her answer exactly. But essentially, it, it, so, so I encourage you to, to get this answer from her. Uh, but essentially, Bernie described success or in, in these terms, you know, being unmistakable as shedding all the layers that are required to be you in a world that is doing everything it can to make sure you're not. And, and I really believe in that. I, I, I believe in the idea that you cannot be happy all the time. You cannot be positive all the time. You cannot be passionate all the time. You are always going to have sorrow and heartbreak and sadness. One doesn't exist without the other in a dualistic world. And that's actually beautiful. However, if you want to experience that side of life as often as possible, it is likely that the best way to do so, to be unmistakable, to be you, to feel that in a deep way, it's really just the exercise in continuously peeling the layers of the onion of everything that is not you. And it's embarrassing it's vulnerable, it's scary, it's oftentimes not rewarding, sometimes it's actually even punishing, yet I still believe that you will still have more moments of, of peacefulness and happiness and fulfillment having done so if you can get there. But it's, it's incredibly vulnerable to expose that middle core of an onion. You know, it's, it's, it takes a lot to peel those layers. So, you know, if you, if you want to be unmistakable, if you want to live in a world in which people know you and your work, and it's obvious they know that that is you and your work, You've got to peel the layers and just literally be unabashedly who you are at the core. And you'll be unmistakable. I think you more than did that question justice. Okay. <laughs> I tried my best. Um, well, Greg, uh, this has been incredible as I expected it would be. And uh, I can't thank you enough for you know, willing to talk for damn near three hours. Yeah, man, I, I greatly uh, uh, appreciate it because I, I've, I, I've struggled to um, and, and have a lot of anxiety around kind of reemerging uh, from my cave-like experience <laughs> of the last 18 months. So, so uh, uh, this, is, this has been a safe space to, to begin to emerge, and I appreciate you for providing that opportunity. Well, uh, I appreciate your willingness to share so much. And by the way, your safe space is about to be heard by five or 6,000 people. <laughs> uh, but uh, again, you know, really, truly appreciate uh, everything you've done, you know, for us as a team and as a company and uh, as a friend. This has been really, really cool. Cool, man. Thank you so much. I really appreciate it. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. And for everybody listening, we will wrap the show with that. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Unmistakable Creative Podcast. While you were listening, were there any moments you found fascinating, inspiring, instructive, maybe even heartwarming? Can you think of anyone, a friend or a family member who would appreciate this moment? If so, take a second and share today's episode with that one person, because good ideas and messages are meant to be shared. Hi, I'm Amy Devers, host of Clever, a podcast about the creative visionaries who shape our world and culture. This year, iconic design company Braun is turning 100. I spoke with Oliver Graves, head of design at Braun, about the lasting impact of the brand and the Braun Prize, their international competition for young designers, inventors, and students. The deadline to enter is August 29th, so there's still time. For details, visit braunprize.org and subscribe to Clever at cleverpodcast.com.